Good morning, monkeys. I hope everyone is doing well today. So today I want to talk about fentanyl. I want to talk about what it's like to overdose on fentanyl. Why are so many people overdosing on fentanyl? If you clicked on this video, you probably know someone that overdosed on fentanyl. You probably know several people at this point because I feel like this is something that is getting way out of control. It's something that's definitely too much of it is happening in our community. So here's a story that I have never told about the time that I overdosed on fentanyl and I'm going to tell you why I didn't even care if I overdosed because I really didn't I think I knew what I was doing I remember making the choice and saying to myself bro fuck it I don't even care if I don't come out of this like I'm either going to feel great or I'm never going to feel again so this was back in 2020 okay Right before COVID, man, this was during February of that year. And right around that time, I had gotten sick. No one knew what COVID was. Anyways, we was in and out of work. So uh, at this time, I was intermittently using, okay? So I was taking Suboxone here and there. I was taking Xanaxes way more often than I should. And when I take Xanaxes, my body keeps going, but my brain just stops working, man. It's just how it is. So on this particular day, I was working. I was at Shockey's in town, the concrete company making giant concrete. And I was a loyal, you know, worker. I showed up every day. But these few days, I was showing up and I was wrecked. I mean wrecked. I don't know where I was getting Xanaxes from right now, but I was getting them and I was wrecked. So I show up a few days, you know, and then somewhere along these lines i had the excuse to leave i think one of my old lady's kids wanted me to, to be picked up from school or something so i went and got the kid took the kid home and all i did was use this as an excuse to call my buddy who i knew could get some drugs so that's what i did i hit him up i picked him up we went to maryland okay so we go to baltimore right in downtown baltimore and we pick up like i think i got 10 caps and i think he got like 10 caps whatever so on the way back home, I'm in my little Volkswagen. Now I had this little uh, 2004 green Volkswagen. And I really liked this car. I'd been taking care of this car, you know, uh, since I had gotten out of jail in 2018, I had bought this car and was taking care of things. And I was doing okay, man, but I still had this urge to use on a constant basis. And when the Xanaxes get involved, bro, forget about it because I'm not making any decisions. The other Jamie is making those choices. So we get the fentanyl and we're sniffing it. We come back, you know, we're coming back down the old way through a uh, back road. So that way we're not on highways and stuff, right? But we're going out through there and we're sniffing and we're laughing, whatever. I should not have been driving. And somewhere along these lines on the way back, man, like say we're high, you know, we got caps of, of fentanyl in our pocket. We're sniffing a little bit. But the whole time in my mind, bro, I know that I'm going to get home and use the needle. I just know that I am because this is what I do. This is what I've been waiting for. If you know anything about injecting drugs at all, you know that sometimes you will get this drug and if you can't inject it, you could snort it right then. But if you can't inject it, you'll wait till you can inject it. And this was my what I wanted to do. Yeah, we sniffed a couple, whatever, but that was never gonna get me where I wanted to be. Anyways, as I'm driving back home, there happens to be these speed bumps that they put in the middle of the road back there somewhere. And I've never seen these speed bumps before. I drove this road a hundred times. I hit this speed bump at like 50 miles an hour in my lowered Volkswagen, bro. And when I tell you we jump like Dukes of Hazard, we jump like Dukes of Hazard. Boom, ka -ka -ka -ka. Busted my oil pan on my car. Oil is just dumping out all over the road, bro. And I don't know what to do. I'm like, you know, I'm Xanaxed up. I'm high as hell on fentanyl. And now I'm figuring I'm going to blow my car up. What am I going to do? There's oil leaking out the bottom. I can't keep driving it, but you got to get home. So I'm trying to drive home. What do I do? I stop at a store. I buy like eight quarts of oil, bro. And I'm stopping like every 10 minutes and I'm just adding a quart of oil as this oil is just dumping out of my frigging car. Okay. Long story short, I do get it home. I don't blow my car up. I don't know how. There was definitely a trail of oil from that speed bump all the way to my house, guaranteed. Now, there might have been a few places where I was going a little fast and just a couple drips, but it was there. So I get home, man, and like, I don't really remember much from this point forward, dude, because all I know is that I had it set in my mind that I wanted to get high and I wanted to get high the way that I wanted to get high, you know, with a friggin' needle that was just how it was 
So I think I did. I think I did shoot up that night. And I guess I got through that, bro. But the next day I had to go to work. Okay. So I was getting up in the mornings and I had a connection where I was getting Delauded's and I was getting Xanax's. So I was getting up in the mornings a little bit earlier and I was doing me a big old jam right to the arm before I went in, man. Delauded, a little bit of Xanax, whatever. Thought I was okay. Argue with you that I was okay. I wasn't slurring my words. Knowing that I was now that I think about it. Hindsight is twenty twenty. Somewhere along the lines that morning, I figured, yo, I'm going to do another one. And anybody that knows anything about these pills, man, you know that you don't know what's in them. You don't know how much is in them. But I didn't care, bro. I really didn't care. I was at the point in my life for some reason. I don't even know why, but I just didn't care. I was like, yo, if I get high off of this, great. If I die off of this, fuck it. That's where I was at, bro. I didn't care. Um, I don't know why, but I just didn't care. And, uh, I really don't remember much after that point other than waking up in the hospital after being Narcan several times. Um, real groggy, didn't know what had happened, didn't know what was going on, but I knew I had handcuffs on. I was still on probation, so off to jail we go. Fentanyl in your system is a crime. So I go into the jail, they lock me up, bro, and I, I mean, like, going to the jail, being in the hospital, being booked in, I don't remember any of that stuff, really, I really don't. The first thing I really remember was walking into the block, I think they had me an AB block or whatever, but as soon as I walked in, I looked up, and then there was Eric, like, he was in a cell on the top tier, he yelled my name, um, I don't even know if I had my contacts in or could see, but I remember him yelling my name, and I was like, get the, that's crazy. Anyways, they put me in a cell, you know what I mean, and I kind of slept it off for a couple of days, bro, but... Then you wake up from this uh, numbed, foggy state of mind, right? And you start to realize what you did. You start to think about, you know, I could have died, bro, and I really didn't even care. And then, like, you know, my whole family found out. My whole family told my family, and they're talking about it while I'm in jail. And, you know, uh, I just had a lot of regrets sitting in themselves, man. And I just remember walking around the jail. We was only out a couple hours a day because like this is right during COVID. So like I went in on a Tuesday and then the Friday that I was there after that Tuesday was the first Friday of COVID. So on this Friday was when no one had any toilet paper or anything, bro. So I'm on the phone with my girl and stuff like, what do you mean there's no toilet paper? Like the world's ending and I'm in jail. Like this is literally what I'm thinking at this point, man. I'm just like, Wow, you know, you picked a real great time to to go off the edge, folks, because that's what I did, man. Like I said, I just didn't care. I didn't care if I was going off the edge. And I've tried many times to think about why I didn't care, bro, because I had a lot going for me. I was working. I was doing good. I had a girl, I had my kids, you know what I'm saying? It wasn't like I was in a bad place as far as having money or anything like that. I was just using you know, and I'm sure any of you that use, man, can identify with that. And any of you that don't know what it's like to be in that situation, man, trust me, it's not anything you feel like you can control in the moment. So, uh, you know, you got to deal with us. You got to deal with us till we get to a point where, you know, something horrible happens. Like we pass away through fentanyl overdoses, man. And that's happened many times to many of my friends. So anyways, uh, I got out of jail in about two weeks. I hadn't, um, Proba I hadn't had any probation violations for 17 years, okay? So uh, the first time they gave me a court date that was like three months away, and I was like, bro, I can't sit here for three months, man. But anyways, I was ready to lay her on down, man. Ordered up some commissary, was ready to lay it on down. They gave me a pro bono lawyer through David Hensley's office, and that dude called me up immediately. He got me another court date. Then the next Friday was when we had court, and they had finally moved us from... Uh, the classification area of the jail and they put me over into the annex so i stayed in the annex all night came out the next morning they're doing a little temperature check on the head bro and i was like 99 and they didn't want to take me everybody in the van was like yo just let him go just let him go i'm like dude i go to home today like let me go to court so that i can go home so he let me in the van i go to court they, they released me i sit in the jail till i don't know one o'clock that day or something and then they let me go so coming home from all that man you know you got to come back and you got to face the reality of the people that that know these things. You got to face your kids and your parents and your, your job and all that stuff. I had lost my job. That's not even part of the point because I'm glad I lost that job. But uh, coming home and facing everybody else, seeing my moms and seeing my kids and having my daughter ask me like what was on my mind at the time, bro, um, really sunk in with me and made me think about like what was on my mind, dude, because I really don't know what it was. 
Um, but yeah, it was definitely foggy. It was definitely a horrible experience, man. Um, and also to put a little icing on the cake of everything like that, <laughs> that's already bad enough, right? About two months goes by, I'm laying in bed. Now, when they come in and got me for the overdose, they Narcan me and everything, but they also still found eight caps. Like there was literally still eight of the 10 caps left. I had only shot two. So they charged me with uh, distribution of fentanyl, which is just absolutely crazy to me. Never distributed fentanyl or anything like that in my life, especially fentanyl. Might have sold a few pills when I was younger, but that's a long time ago. So anyways, they charged me with this, bro. And like, I go to, the, the, to my lawyer and my lawyer's like, dude, you're facing like, I think he said six or eight years minimum. Like, he's like, if I can get everything done in six or eight years minimum. And I'm like, dude, I've never distributed. And you know, whatever, whatever, whatever. $8,000 later, I paid off David Hensley, man. I paid him straight cash, bro. Eight, 100, or eight, it was $8,100 bills. I took right in there. They canned them out. And, uh. It was like a week later, we was leaving a job. He had COVID. He called me and he said, man, I've had everything gnaw processed, which was like, holy shit. Because at this point in my life, bro, I can't go to sleep at night without thinking I'm going to jail for six or seven more years. Uh, I can't take a shower without thinking about how I'm going to be showering in a jail shower for six or seven more years. Um, I can't talk to, see my kids or even think of their names without thinking that I'm going to have to tell my kids I'm going back to jail for six or seven more years. And this is not sitting well with me, man. So when he told me that he had everything all processed, which it should have been all processed, man, straight up, because I was never selling anything. I was a user. You should be able to tell by the way I overdosed. They, they got a task force around here and I'm nowhere near their radar because I don't do anything like that. So he checked into all those things, got it dismissed, man, which was an absolute blessing. And from that point, man, I haven't touched any kind of fentanyl. I haven't touched any kind of drugs like that that put me over the edge. Now, don't get it twisted. Uh, let me say this. I haven't had a habit, okay? So I haven't had a habit, um, which is different than using, yes. I have fallen down. I have used pills here or there. Um, but that's been six, eight months, man. I haven't done any of those things, dude. I'm doing really well. I do smoke my weed, bro. It's totally legal right here in Virginia. I don't understand why they haven't legalized it further. This stuff right here can be a medicine for you. That is a promise. If you can't smoke it, then I feel sorry for you because this stuff really helps me to center myself, man. Uh, so anyways, I just wanted to touch on how this was for me, man, because, you know, I talk a lot about people dying. I talk a lot about, uh, you know, like my shirts, dude, you know, fuck fentanyl, bro. That's just how I feel. I feel like it's killed too many of my friends. It's killing too many people. It's an epidemic and it, it just, it's, it's such a horrible thing. So I'm trying to spread awareness, man. I'm trying to let people know that this isn't a way to live. Like you can bounce back from that. You know, you can live a good life, bro. I am far from having money in my life, but I don't think money is the root of happiness. I'm stressed out because I don't have money. Yes, man, I do have bills and I work my ass off to try to pay my bills. But I'm not using today, dude, and I'm grateful for that. Like, you got to be grateful to be clean no matter where you are. Because wherever you are right now and struggling with addiction or having to go chase your dope down or being sick or whatever the consequences are that come with your drug of choice, man, being clean in the worst situation is way better than being high in the worst situation, right? Just like in jail, man. I always say my best day in jail was never as good as my worst day on the street. I just want to be out here. I just want to be free. Anyways, man, I, uh, a couple people told me that I should do a couple of talking head videos where I talk to you guys myself instead of doing so many podcasts, man, where I can tell you a little bit more about me and the effects of drugs and alcohol and, and jail and friggin' all that stupid gangster life drug addict BS is, it's not good, man. Just leave all that shit behind. Until the next time, man, don't sweat the petty things, pet the sweaty things.